All right, thank you so, so much, Adora and Utibe. And that was an exciting interview that you had in Abuja. Of course, we'll be looking at youth unemployment in Nigeria. And you do know that Nigeria, according to available statistics, has a youth population of 80 million people. That's representing about 60% of the total population of over 180 million people. That's about half of that population, if you ask me. Now, 64 million Nigerian youths are said to be unemployed, while 1.6 million of the youths are underemployed doing jobs below their acquired skills or qualification now this bogus youth unemployment figure which is now increasing at an alarming rate is what some political and economic experts are concerned about as the unsuspecting youths easily fall prey into the waiting hands of some unscrupulous politicians who use them as political thugs of course during every election while the female uh, youths enlarge the prostitution racket uh. Another school of thought attributes this ugly development to the quality of graduates who lack requisite and marketable skills now flowed in the labor markets on a yearly basis. These and many more issues raise the need for policymakers to inculcate job creation in the nation's development plan. I have two gentlemen in the studio who will be doing justice to this topic, will be telling us exactly what should be done to ensure that this figure, if not uh, reduced uh, drastically, of course, is actually, uh, you know, the youth get involved in other skills that can make them become profitable and also enhance the economic development of the country. I have in the studio Elvis Emecheta. Elvis Emecheta is an economic analyst. He's actually the president of Nigeria's China Chamber of Commerce and industry. It's my pleasure having you here. Thank you so much. All right. And Elvis is being joined by Isaac Wangko. Isaac is a legal practitioner. He's also a youth leader. He heads the CHW Youth Organization. That's a community of Hashim Worldwide Youth Organization. Isaac, it's my pleasure again. Thank you very much. Good morning. Okay. Let's begin with you, Elvis. President. Nigeria China Chamber of Commerce and Industry that tells me that you're you've been in the field really looking at you know creation of job and how people you know get involved that, let's look at the statistics uh, Nigerian youth unemployment 64 million out of 180 million people is this good for a country a developing country like Nigeria no absolutely no because uh, what is supposed to be our source of strength you know, the productive population in that age bracket has turned around to become an albatross. Nowhere in the world you can rationalize this. When we get out of this country, we boast that we have um, youths, that we are a nation that could do A, B, C, D. And the white people, or the folks out there, believe us. Oh, yeah, you have a massive uh, productive youth population. Nigeria could do everything, but you can see what it has found out to. So it is mind-boggling. It is absolutely unacceptable if we want to, you know, figure out what is, if we want to do justice to this nation. Uh -huh. It's not right. Now, what do you think is really responsible for this high figure? Well, again, we have to, government of Nigeria, I'm sorry to say this, does not want to invest in, in, its, in its own people over the years. Yeah, this is something I can't believe. What do I mean by investing in your own people? You have to support programs that engage the youths. You're not doing that. You're not supporting businesses. Left and right. You're churning back houses of uh, monetary policies that weaken businesses. When I mean business, I mean talking about the reset, agriculture, manufacturing, and all those things. You can see what has been what has been going on since last year. I'm telling you, 80% of businesses have folded up. Those are businesses that should engage the weeds. And when they are suffering, when they are bleeding, of course you can't talk about engaging. A diamond cannot be engaging somebody. Okay, now let's hear from you, Isaac. You are a youth leader, and I know um, being a youth leader gives you opportunity to beat a lot of youths, you know, who are having some kind of challenges. So, what are basically, you are youth, a youth yourself, what are the basic challenges facing Nigerian youth today? Why you think there's so much, uh, you know, high rate of unemployment in the country? Um, it's, it's actually a mix of a lot. So, in, uh, to address this, there's the government, 
uh, at all levels. So you have the state government as well as you have the, uh, the federal government. And then you have, the, of course, the educational institutions as well as the youths themselves. Um, there have been actually there have been policies, if you if you if we must say the truth, there have been lots of pol policies. Uh, the first, of which I can remember, is um, the establishment of the National Youth Service Corps in 1973, and then uh, the National Directorate of Employment in 1986, and then uh, more recently under um, the government of President Olusegun Obasanjo in 2001, there was a NAPEP. We have policies, we have platforms, but what we find missing is the will. There is no willpower, and that again goes back to the, the quality of leadership we have in Nigeria. Um, like they say uh, across the world, leadership is everything. If you want to get anything right, your, your leadership is what can you know, secure um, and that for a nation. So, um, it, having said that, that's on the one hand, I, I really wouldn't you know, speedily um, lay 100% of the blame on um, the federal government or whatever government or leadership that, um, that should be um, under the spotlight. Even the youth as well. What is even most shocking is the fact of um, unemployability. That, that's, what's, that's what's so shocking. There are a number of people who have abilities. It's very clear that your ability, for example, is in music or your ability is in medicine. And because it is more popular to, you know, uh, these days to be a graduate, you, rather than, you know, wait it out to ensure that you are adequately qualified, um, you go and study, say, for example, um, ge geography or law, just so that you don't sit at home. But, you know, that's not, that's not, it's a, it's a, education is a means to an end. Um, so it's quite a whole lot of, of, um, of, of issues. issues. Mm. Yeah. Now let's let's look at even the, the, the issue you just raised about our unemployability. Now there's there's so many issues. First is unemployability, which you talked about. Now the, the other one is the fact that you know many Nigerian youth seek white collar job. Now the crave for white collar job. You know, you think that is what Nigerian youth should be talking about at this point in time? Uh, certainly not, uh, to be honest. Um, and that's why there has been this, this drive for entrepreneur, entrepreneurship, if you will. Uh, I've had several conversations with young people, and it is very easy for, if you've been in leadership, especially leadership of young people, you, it's easy to identify their, you know, their strengths. And then you know just on the spur of the moment that this one doesn't fit into a white collar you know, job environment. That this one is certainly a baker or a musical artist or a graphic designer or a technical person and there's there's that mismatch again so i, I mean i have a lot of examples that i can i can i'll be very happy to give there, there's a lady who went to um, you know like she studied um, english well thankfully it was english and then all the while her strength was in baking but then she was working i mean in a lot of white you know color environments and uh, until we had we had to you know share the home truth, and eventually she she got empowerment, went to the U.S. to study you know further in um, baking and all its uh, related activities, and now she's doing very well, far much better. And she was doing she was even in the, doing the office environment. The office environment uh. yeah. And that's that's the case with a lot of young people. Uh, okay, obvious. Now, looking at this, you are, you are an entrepreneur, I know. Um, what has been the drive? I, I don't know if you did any white collar job before you, you, you decided to be on your own and start employing people. Well, when I left secondary school, way back in Alicia, we, we did what I call auxiliary teaching. Was a, there was a acute shortage of teachers. And they picked a few of us uh, the past time with grade one at the station and gave us a job just for one year from there and went off to the university. So that was my only, only experience with white collar uh -huh. job. But I tell you something, not too many people if they had the opportunity would want to get involved with white collar job. People want to create wealth. You think so? Oh yes. And when it comes to Nigerian youths as well. Oh, yes. Yes. What is driving them to white collar jobs? Societal wala. When you see the public servants, how rich they became, the directors, what they were doing with money. And you say, okay, if I get a degree and join the civil service, over the years I'll be spending money like that man. You know, again the corruption index we're talking about. But ordinarily people would like to sit down 
and earn something and create wealth and even employ people. But you see, Nigeria reverses the case. Not too many people will want to go that route. Now, that problem is that well, you, you were able to surmount that challenge and you went into it because I know there's also fear of the unknown. You know, if you go out there and start your own, what happens if the business crumbles and all of that? So how were you able to surmount those challenges for any youth that is listening to you to know exactly how to take that bull step? In nowadays, in nowadays, yeah, it wasn't things weren't as bad as the challenges weren't that this yes, much. Yes, government are very close to the we are very close to the people. Government was very supportive. You know what I mean? And you know, well, compared relatively honestly in what we are doing, but now it's uh, bizarre to see what goes on in the society. Okay, and people are okay. You want to do business? I don't have capital. I can't do this. Where do I start? The only escape is take a white collar job. In most of their senses or psych, they say, okay, I'll go there, get some money, get out, and start something on their on my own. You I tell you, if you call ten or ten people to tell them, would you want to do something on your own? They say yes. But I need to be here for some time to earn some money and uh, get out and do what I want to do. Start up capital okay. to, to start the business. Which unfortunately the system here doesn't provide. And I get the credit for university education, who says that we must have over a hundred universities? Great nations of the world, like Germany, they don't have that many universities. They have technical schools that empower you skillfully. Most of the German engineers you see here, they're not graduates of university. They went through technical schools. They valued and they treasured the most. The here is different because they start evaluating you with a degree. Yeah, because I'm just going to ask you, you know, let, let me ask this for, for the youth, really. Uh, so how do you, do, do you go about what uh, Elvis is talking about? Because if you, you are seeking for a job, for instance, in Nigeria, to the first, they want to know how many degrees you've gotten um, from school, how many um, uh, master's degree or yeah, PhD Montemaria. you have gotten. Yeah, yeah the more the merrier, you know. And uh, the one that is just leaving technical school might end up not getting a job, even though he has more skills. And then that's where you, you also have people now who are graduates who should be working, you know, practicing their profession, doing many old jobs, you know, that these are the people they say they are underemployed. So how do you think this can be tackled? Now you work in, a, in an environment, you know, office environment. Do you think really that, you know, Nigerian youths have actually, or, or let me say the government have actually, you know, taken its toll on people who have skills to, to deliver, you know, uh, except going to look for people who who uh, have certificates, so to speak. That's why today you hear about certificate scandals, you know, this person didn't graduate or that person didn't graduate, because at the end of the day, there's so much emphasis on papers. Sure. Um, interestingly, as uh, Martin Luther King says, he says education is, um, should achieve two things. One is um, intelligence and character. We don't we don't see that around here. I mean, look at the government of the day, in terms of you know quality of education. Do we uh, do they demonstrate that intelligence that education should give, or the character that education should even give as well? And so it is. It, it, you the government. You know you can't give what you don't have. If the quality of leadership we have in in this case Nigeria is below par, you know below average, there's only so much they can do. Uh, and, and it will be very difficult for them to even prioritize education. So, for, uh, for example, there's a recent conversation about JAM. Um, the, the proposal you know, uh, um, that JAM is hoping to initiate to lower the minimum you know, uh, entry requirements. And that, that will affect it. And that's because the system emphasizes a lot on certificates. And that certificate is ordinarily supposed to be a means to an end. It, it should demonstrate your ability to, you know, to do certain, um, um, you know, to achieve, you know, s s what you've gone to school to achieve, say if it was um, to study, say if it was uh, French when you study, you should not only be able to speak or write, you should also be able to communicate as far as the literature, you know, is, uh, is also concerned. But uh, unfortunately, we don't see that, you know, around in Nigeria. And like... Um, uh, my colleague here has actually rightly stated um, there are a number of young people who if you'd ask about 
eight out of nine is that startling if you ask them would you want to start something on your own given the capital they'll tell you yes i mean it's that startling go to go take a tour around nigeria go to other there are young people you see what they're doing with their hands you don't have to even go to china or europe or america just go take a trip to Abba, or would you want to go up north? I mean, the farmers, the young people, even the herdsmen as well. Uh, would you want to come down south? I, I take a trip almost on a daily basis to Oshodi. I see the crowd of young people that's just mill away. And it's not very good, you know, for the nation, either for the young people or the nation's economy. It's not, it's not good at all. And so government really needs to engage its young people, you know, um, more. Uh -huh. And government needs to engage its young people more. How would government do this? Now let's look at some of the you know the initiatives that government has done in the past. In the past and I mean, um, successive administrations. He, he said MAPEP before uh, during Obasanjo era. Uh, even during Jonathan, we had the UWIN. You had the you know so many of them. But people are raising questions, you know, as to why those programs have been unsuccessful. Uh, some said finance is the issue, which is what you're raising here too. Absence of good administration and implementation, and also you have inconsistent policies. Now one government comes brings up a policy that you, you think maybe in the next two, three years it would have been substantiated and everybody would have, you know, you know, uh, had happened into it. And another government comes, jettisons that, starts all over again, another one and, and all of that. Now, if this continues to happen, and many are saying that even government is concentrating more on training, you know, other than giving that capital, startup capital that you're talking about to, to, to start a business. So how best do you think government can begin to do this now, meaning the, the present administration? Unfortunately, we have always, we have to keep calling on government because of the way our system works. Right. If you imagine that uh, we basically are not a productive nation, we sell crude oil, raw materials, and that money is shared by government. So the man that takes so much, is expected to give us so much. They can't hide it, they can't run away from that. They're building reserves in New York banks and stuff like that. Millions of their own youths are not having anything to do. And then you pride yourself, oh, I saved up this. When you should do everything to empower kids here. So the government has a cash, they have a treasury, so much money. Let them be honest with this. Let them bring them out. Take a risk with these youth, these kids. You know how to do it. You know how to use EFCC to, to chase down people. When you give somebody, I've given you this money to start this. You get people to sign up for you. If I don't see you, I'll come after these people. I don't, I don't think Nigerians are that criminal minded. They don't go out, they don't set out to steal. Believe me. But they just have to do it because when one policy fails, if, for instance, somebody will go out, do you know that Nigerian business or private sector have more credibility than Nigerian government? Of course. That's very private. Somebody like Oscharis, for instance, this is hypothetical, can call up Toyota. I need one shipload of Toyota or Ford Motors in America. They will dispatch. But tell the Nigerian government to order for something. They won't listen to them. But look at again what happened with this monetary policy that we've been through over a couple of uh, months now. Whatever this man earned in the past 10 years has been wiped out because he traced on credibility, on credit. At the end of the day, you devalue Naira, the man has imported, paid duties, did everything, lodged his money in the bank to remit to his uh, principal. Then you devalue my all of a sudden he needs times three more to bail himself out. So this is what we're saying. These policies are not too good for businesses. Government is in control of our treasury. So they should shine their eye and look, okay, how do we deploy it to the best use of Nigeria? Simple. Uh -huh. All right. As a youth leader, um, I'm just wondering, because we keep talking government, 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 is there anything the youths themselves can do? After all, it's all about their life instead of going into social vices. Or is there anything the youths themselves can do to, you know, reposition themselves and actually take their destiny in their own hands? Um, well, there's, there's quite a lot that the, you know, young people can do. So, um, for example, uh, there's, there's an initiative that we have we've established and also back in 2015 and it's uh, called the uh, the Global Youth Conference. 
and the intention is to just provide an opportunity where seniors in the society who have achieved a lot will share their wisdom because you know when you cross over 40 well into 50s what you have is no you don't your the amount of your energy you know uh, reduces and you you know through your experience you have more wisdom than young people so at, you know seniors would come to that platform the opportunity to pass on their wisdom share their wisdom with young people but what we have these days unfortunately is um, the seniors don't share you know for whether they I don't know if it's because they don't have the willpower they're they're not very sure how the young people will see them you know or and that's why we actually created that platform um, the global youth conference and the first edition was held in in um, in a and our target audience was just about 500 people and we we're amazed to see over a thousand slightly over a thousand people at over attend and that established the fact that there's there's this hunger you know in young people to to tap um, from the knowledge tap of, from the knowledge of young people of, 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 the, of the elderly of all the okay. seniors and it got to a point there was former the former vc of Imo State university who was a um, keynote speaker he had to admit you know having engaged him he had to admit that the seniors have failed you know the young people uh because it's it is very clear uh, it says in terms of morality, in terms of um, placing priority, there is more priority now on material possessions than on you know adding value to an economy. So the, the second edition of the conference is is uh, rightly scheduled in Abuja, holding on Sunday, 30th April 2017, at the International Conference Center. And the the intention is to engage young people. Uh, we've already invited a lot of seniors. Uh, in the society no is it just about coming to, to, to together to talk then don't don't forget that there have been conferences in sure. nigeria you know uh, apart from the global youth conference you're talking about there have been conferences in the past organized by government organized by ngos organized by even entrepreneurs like him uh, uh, stakeholders in the economy to see how you know they can they can make things work out for the youths but at the end of the day it just ends as a talk shop sure. So, um, how do you intend to go uh, beyond just talking to the people and show that? What, what we're doing is, uh, from my experience, consistency is one of the hardest things in life. Con being consistent, you know, following through to achieving exactly what you set out to achieve. Um, and that's, that's why, from the first edition, we did a survey. Uh, there was a, a form that each participant, you know, completed, and we got the feedback. And we're injecting, you know, that feedback into this, you know, the second edition. And we hope to continue this uh, for as long as as we keep growing older. And then the the children of today would eventually evolve to become youths of tomorrow. Uh. Um, and it has to be sustained. Now, at such conferences, is there room for skill acquisition course, uh, programs? Yeah. Yeah. Where and how do you monitor the youths at the end of the day that attended to ensure that okay, what they have learned, they are practicing, or they are able to access loans and all of that yes. to, to ensure that that is not just a mere talk shop. Exactly. So what we do is also in in the forms that they complete registration forms before the uh, the conference and then after they complete. Of course, uh, they include all the contact details, and we call them and also leave our numbers for them to call us and then there are times because well from my experience i'm a lawyer and i work in a corporate you know uh environment and do a lot of commercial transactions and we help you know even these young people free of charge to start up their you know their businesses register and advise them you know this is what you should do just free of charge just so that they um you know they, they start and then see test their um ability so we provide this support and if we're unable as individuals to provide the support we uh, introduce them to seniors in the society that are very willing uh, uh, to help these young people uh, that sounds interesting and i hope nigerian youth are listening and they won't want to be part of this so uh, back to you lv now skill acquisition that, that he's talking about is an alternative really to this endless search for white collar jobs you know and uh, so many people are saying that okay this is the way to go but do you think nigerian youth are really ready <laughs> he says something that the older ones do not want to share information you know that, that most of them die with what they know without passing it on but the youths themselves do you think they are ready to learn from the older ones if you if you don't ask questions for instance the elder will not know that you, you're interested in knowing so do you think the, what do you think the youth themselves should be doing to see how they can approach those who know better than them and how they can even access this funding again let me let me digress a little bit i think uh, um and i want to be more pragmatic here 
take for instance, you mentioned National Youth Service Corps, so established since 1973. Now tell me why government cannot tap into this. You have an agency that brings together the best of youth. Maybe every year one or two million graduates scattered all over the country. Do you know what it means to have an agricultural settlement? You know what I mean? Government will do, go out of their way consciously to create big agro allied business enterprises all over the country. It is in that kind of setup that the youth must get my would acquire scale agriculture. Do one or two things. You know what I mean? And then would have solved our food security problem. The leaders of the past did it. In the east there's the Warrior Farm settlement. There's Kukuya in the north Granot. We've killed all those things. But the best way to revive them is through this NYSC. Okay, let's pump in so much money in agriculture so that the kids that will be serving in Sokoto who have, we, we all sheltered in a big farm settlement, get, give them the skill, let them even own part of the proceed. Well, it's one full season. And agriculture is a cycle of one year. By the time they leave in that place, back to their various locations. These kids would have earned so much money and have the skill to start off on their own. So I think this is the kind of thing we should be doing now. You think government is not already tapping into that the, the, with, with the youth core members? I don't think if they're doing it, they're, they're doing it so miserly. They're not doing it seriously. It has to be something very, very big, massive, that will say, okay, from their efforts, will feed the nation, who process the raw material, uh, the produce for export, for local consumption, for industries. That is one big, huge potential that unleashed potential in this country. And China went through that route mm -hmm. in the beginning. Sure. Don't forget they were basically agrarian society. By the time of Deng Xiaoping, the little man that took over from Mao Zedong, he empowered the rural folks, strengthened the agriculture creating a, a processing zones across the country. And look at where they are today. Why can't we take that route? All right, um, Isaac, uh, when you organize conferences, you called it Global Youth Conference, isn't it? Yes, please. And th that makes me believe that you have people from outside the country attending that, that yes, conference. Please. Okay, are you making any arrangement? Are you in contact with any government agency at all to ensure that, you know, whatever um, y y the outcome of this conference, you know, will impact meaningfully on the youth? Is there any way the government can come in to support what you're doing? I mean, I'll be very happy. Uh, to even use this opportunity to invite the the, uh, the presidency, if you will, or even the uh, minister, minister for trades and investment, as well as the minister for um, technology, to to come and speak. What we need it is it is a struggle to even confirm the government's intention, its plans for the young people in uh, in Nigeria as we speak, because we are yet to even have that platform, that engagement. We are currently in talk, in talks with um, you know a few of them to see if they can come. But of course, you know as always, the protocol is quite uh, cumbersome. But we'll keep trying, as as they say, and hopefully would um, would get uh, positive uh, feedback. Response. All right, um, Elvis. Just before we go, what would be your advice to Nigerian youths who are probably watching you on this program as to how to breeze the trail and you know see how they can actually do something for themselves? I know it's difficult because the reason would always, which is right, that uh, we don't know where to start, we don't have the resources, we don't have the Their life is basically hopeless. And now, you, you are in the field. How do you go about sourcing funds to sustain your own business? You know, as kind of advice to these youths, many of them may not know exactly where to go to. They would always go to the bank and, you know, the banks don't even give out money these days. They say they don't have money anymore. Even for us, business people. We don't access funds easily. Again, the money is not there. So they're playing very smart. With this treasury single account, every money is warehoused with central bank, 
the banks, don't forget that the bank's money are depositors' money or shareholders' money. So they're very, being very, very careful. They don't want to give you money and start chasing you that the money will never come back. <laughs> you know the way it is. Uh, but then again, government is always the one that would that we should do something. Open up this. Uh, Let's say. All right. We well, thank you, gentlemen, for making our time to speak with us. Uh, we've been taking a look at the youth unemployment, the socio-economic impacts, and how the youth can actually be empowered to play its role in national development. And I've been joined by Elvis Emecheta, who is an economic analyst, the president of Nigeria China Chamber of Commerce and Industry, uh, who has given us, of course, clues as to what the youths can do, and also advising government to open up, you know, uh, finances for these youths to start up their businesses. Isaac Wankwo also joined us. He's a legal practitioner, the youth leader community of Hashim Worldwide Youth Association, uh, telling us exactly the challenges Nigerian youth face and what government should do to help Nigerian youth succeed. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure talking to you both. Thank you. All right. I'll link you back to Abidjan now for the concluding part of the program. It's been a pleasure having you join us. Please do join us again.